afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this fantastic uh, webinar that we're going to have here. It's very timely, as Steve mentioned. We have a presidential elections, and uh, this is a time that the whole country is engaged in discussion about the issues. And uh, one of the most important issues that's going to come up is certainly divisions within the ruling class on the issue of wealth and inequality. And uh, so today we're going to be talking about capitalist class divisions, particularly as they affect the strategies and tactics of the working class movement, the CPUSA and other left organizations, progressive organizations. So why does the class need strategies and tactics? And the way I'm using strategies and tactics is in a very simple manner. Strategies are long-term plans, long-term vision. Tactics would be shorter-term uh, plans and uh, for executing the struggles, for planning and, and continuing the struggles of the working class. So why does the working class need strategies and tactics? It has to continuously mobilize, organize and engage in struggle. It must have a winning strategy. So we must have a strategy that takes into consideration what's happening with the ruling class. Taxi, tactics must take into consideration what the working class is prepared to do and where the ruling class divisions make room for advance. So both things have considered in developing this uh, strategies and tactics. So what does the CPUSA uh, have to say about this? Uh, I think it says it very well in the Road to Socialism, the party program, where it says that general divisions in the capitalist class contain significant opportunities for working class and progressive forces. On some issues, the more moderate more realistic sections of the capitalist class and its political operatives move in parallel with the people's movements as, as important though temporary allies. They can be pressured to adopt a more progressive stance by the strength of the people's movements and mass sentiments. One example would be certainly the, um, how Clinton has been changing her positions relative to those of Bernie Sanders uh, as the uh, presidential elections move forward. Um, here's an uh, interesting comment from Lenin. He wrote this in Left Wing Communism and Infantile Disorder. And here Lenin was uh, justifying uh, conciliatory tactics and compromises with other parties, including bourgeois parties. This perspective became the basis for the common terms of the Communist International's 1922 United Front tactic. So what Lenin said was that the most powerful enemy can be vanquished only by exerting the utmost effort and by the most thorough, careful, attentive, skillful, and obligatory use of any and even the smallest rift between the enemies, any conflict of interest among the bourgeoisie of the various countries and among the various groups and types of bourgeoisie within the various countries, and also by taking advantage of any, even the smallest opportunity of winning a mass ally, even though this ally is temporary, vacillating, unstable, unreliable and conditional. So we don't make allies only with those that we, we fully trust and we wish to make permanent uh, allies of, but rather uh, even those that are only temporary, vaseline, unstable, unreliable and, and conditional. So what is the main uh, division within the capitalist class today? It is on the issue of wealth and economic inequality. In the United States today, 10% of the people own more than 70% of all the wealth. 50%, another way of putting it is 50% of the people own nothing or actually are in debt. Economic inequality has a racist edge to it as well. Concentration of wealth inevitably leads to concentration of power. That is, and this concentration of power is private appropriation of social power, which is a real threat to democracy. So here is a a manner in which the issues, economic issues, also affect the democratic issue. An important sector of U.S. and global capitalism views the growing inequality as a threat to capitalism itself. So I will be going into that. Um, I was asked earlier, which sector would this be? And I'm not looking at the entire sector, but I'm looking at a portion of the sector. Uh, that sector resides on Wall Street and on Fleet Street. 
In Wall Street, this sector is represented by Robert Rubin, a former Goldman Sachs and City Group banker, co-chair of the Council on Foreign Relations, founder of the Brooklyn Institute. Uh, they were the main group behind Clint, the Clintons and Obama. Uh, Robert Rubin and Bill Clinton bear primary responsibility for repealing the Glass-Steagall Act, separating investment banking from commercial banking. The repeal of this law was primarily responsible for the global financial crisis of 2008. So well, some of these people are now uh, trying to address the issue of uh, gross wealth and economic inequality. They bear a lot of the responsibility for what has happened to date, but they recognize that today uh, this inequality threat to capitalism itself. And to bring it even closer uh, to mind, for the entire class, the 2008 global financial crisis showed the instability of global finance capital, and that is what uh, scared a lot of this this sector of the capitalist class. So, because of this, uh, they called together a coalition of uh, for inclusive capitalism. This is the name of the group that was formed by this sector of finance capital. And this, this is not an insignificant sector. Um, this coalition for inclusive capitalism uh, as a ruling class group controls one third of all the global liquid assets. And they met recently in London. Um, the membership includes Lady Lynn Forrester, the Rothschild of the Rothschild family, CEOs of multinational corporations such as Dow Chemical, Aetna, PepsiCo, Unilever, Blackstone, and many others commercial investment bankers, other global, other global, uh, powerful global financial interests in the Anglo-Saxon world, Wall Street, Fleet Street in the UK, and beyond. So here we have a, um, a photograph, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, here's a photo of uh, Lady Lynn Forster, the Rothschild. She's chairman and co-founder of the Coalition for Inclusive Capitalism. She's very close to the Clintons. At the meeting they had of this coalition, uh, Christine Lagarde, uh, managing director of International Monetary Fund and conference speaker, had the following to state. She quoted both Karl Marx's prediction that capitalism carries the seat of its own destruction and Pope Francis' characterization of increasing inequality as the root evil. Now, this is an important word that Christine Lagarde is talking about, and, and she's not an insignificant person in this sector of, of the ruling class. Christine Lagarde it was a center-right French corporate lawyer, former French Minister of Commerce, Industry, and Finance, and Forbes lists her as the fifth most powerful woman in the world. So. When she speaks, uh, people do listen. She goes on to say that she goes on to refute the favored capitalist reaction to rise in inequality, and I'm quoting here that ultimately we should care about equality of opportunity, not equality of outcomes. And if you, I'm sure most of you have seen this quotation, not in reference to the issue of wealth and, in, and, and economic inequality, but, but rather with respect to uh, uh, the race, the race issue here in the United States, and, and uh, unequal uh, conditions for uh, f uh, along race lines in the United States. On uh, to state that the problem is that opportunity can never be equal in an un a deeply unequal society. Let me repeat that because that's that's very important. The problem is that opportunity could never be equal in a deeply unequal society. And that's what we have. We have a deeply unequal society. And so when people talk about just equality of opportunity, that is, is a myth because there's, there can, no such thing can occur in a, um, in a society that's, uh, such, so deeply unequal. Here we have a photograph of, uh, of uh, Bills with uh, with Christine Lagarde, and uh, at the conference on uh, an inclusive capitalism that occurred in London. Also at this conference, uh, they heard from uh, Mark Garney, governor of the Bank of England, 
And he, he warned with strong language that the capitalist system was at risk. Just as any revolution eats its children, unchecked market fundamentalism can devour the social capital essential for the long-term dynamism itself. So what, what is the governor of Ringa saying here? He's saying is that unchecked capitalism is devouring the working class, that without the aggregate demand from the working class, the consumer, that is the consumer, the majority of the consumers, capitalism has long-term long fundamental problems. As Marx said, the main contradiction of capitalism is overproduction and underconsumption. Capitalism drives wages down to increase profits. Workers have less money to spend, and that drives down production, leading to cyclical revolution. Uh, another person that chimed in on, on this issue, of, and also uh, with respect to what was happening in um, and what was being said at this conference on inclusive capitalism was uh, Christia Friendland. She's the federal uh, member of the Parliament for Toronto Center. Also the author of Plutocrats, The Rise of the New Global, Super Rich, and the Fall of Everybody Else. And in, in this, uh, what, what's the word plutocrat here is are basically people whose power derives from their wealth. And she, she's quoted as saying, what's striking is that today, 30 years later, after the beginning of the neoliberal policy, which started in, in the early 1980s or late 1970s, some gatherings of the plutocrats, we are starting to hear speeches that would not have been out of place at Zuccotti Park, that is, uh, during the Occupy movement. Interesting comment. So how is the ruling class sector raising the alarm uh, of this danger to capitalism? And here enters uh, Thomas Piketty, author of Capitalism in the 21st Century by Harvard University Press. So how, how is it that this university professor wasn't very well known, who's been talking about, about uh, uh, economic and wealth inequality uh, in his economic papers at, at uh, academic presentations for quite a long time, relatively young. Uh, how did he come to become the, uh, to be on Amazon's bestseller list? Uh, he has sold over two million hard copies of this 700 page weighty tome. Not to actually read it page, you know, cover to cover. Um, but the reason he was able to do this is certainly because a sector of the ruling class says this is an important book and it's based on solid evidence. So what is, uh, what is Piketty, uh, what, what, what made this book so important? First of all, he based it on empirical evidence, on data. He went back and collected data since the 1700s, not only for Europe, you know, he's from, from France, but also for the United States and other countries. He was able to look at this whole historical record of the concentration of wealth and the ratio between capital and wages and income across countries and across the different uh, decades. So here we have a, a photograph or a picture of um, a sketch of many people reading Capital. And uh, like I said, it's about two million people have read it, bought it, hard copies, and uh, widely discussed in, in most of the media. So what, is, um, what does Piketty prove in his book? Uh, he's using a novel approach, actual data, which is quite rare in economic circles where the most, uh, the most used um, method this mathematical formulas um, instead of actual data. Um, what he says is worsening inequality is an inevitable outcome of capitalism itself, even free market capitalism. So even those that talk about the real danger of capitalism is crony capitalism, it's more than that. It's just the free market capitalism that is existing, which it does not. But even the most free market capitalist system 
will still inevitably lead to inequality of, uh, of outcome of capitalism itself. That the rate of return on capital, that is how much money capital returns in, in, in the form of profits and, and, and dividends and so forth, will always exceed the growth of income and output, that is wages. So it would always do this, it always has done it throughout history, and it's getting worse. Capitalism in inherent dynamic propels all threatened democratic societies. And um, so uh, go, going back to what he said about the rate of return on capital, he says that the rate, rate of return on capital, that is capital gains on stocks and bonds and so forth, on, Average, on average, they, they're about 4 to 5 percent. Yet the average increase in income and output, that is, you can also look at it in terms of the gross domestic product, is averaging somewhere between 0 to 1.5 percent per year. Bottom line is that the rich are getting richer and the working class is drowning or barely floating. And the, then he goes on to make another very important statement, and that is only intervention by the state can reduce wealth inequality. And he suggests a progressive annual tax on capital. Now, he does suggest one on global capital because that's always going to be a counter to this argument is that capital will flee the United States where it is taxed more heavily it would flee to other areas of the world. So he's talking about a global uh, progressive tax on capital. But here's an interesting concept that we certainly should uh, push on our agenda, that we should have a, a tax on capital. There is such a thing here in this country, it's called a capital tax, uh, capital gains tax, but it's very low and, and a lot of, uh, uh, so it's not rate, it's not taxed at, at the proper level. And that's certainly no, and that's only on the stock market, it's not wealth in general, so there needs to be a progressive tax. He's talking about all wealth, all the assets. So, um, he, he also makes very interesting um, observations about prior ruling class concessions. So, he's, he's, what he's saying here is that the ruling class has made concessions in the past. So what we're talking about here, and, and what we talk, when we're talking about this sector of the ruling class that wants to make some concessions, that wants to reduce the gross inequality in wealth and income, there's precedence for this. So he goes on to talk about the New Deal back in the 1930s, and that it came about because of ruling class differences, divisions within the ruling class on how to deal with the Russian Revolution, and the growing appeal of communism and socialism, the Great Depression, joblessness, rest, union organizing, and growing communist left influence, and the need for labor support for the coming war against fascism. So that's what the, um, the state was dealing with back in the 1930s, and they had to make a concession It came to be known as the, the New Deal. So what did, uh, how did we react during that period? How did we in the working class, in, in the left movement, in the CP, how did we react during that period? We made bold demands for unemployment compensation, bold demands for social security, and bold demands for labor rights, and so forth. So what were the lessons, uh, and, and more recent lessons as well, the bold creative uh, moves like the Occupy movement can change the dynamics of the struggle. They certainly can change the framework of the discussion, and it has done that. So when we talk about the 99% or we're talking about the 1%, we're talking about some of the uh, verbal um, framework that was um, brought about because of the Occupy movement. That bold demands like those for, from Democratic Socialist Bernie Sanders can move millions into the electoral economic struggle and the battle of ideas. The bold demands like 5 for 15 can bring results, and they've already brought results, and more results will be coming. Especially in an atmosphere in which the a sector of the ruling class, of the capitalist class, is ready to make such concessions in order to preserve 
the stability of capitalism and, and to look after the future of capitalism. We also learned some recent lessons concerning the, the recent massive nonviolent civil disobedience in front of the U.S. Capitol. Chrissy Spring demonstrates that, mean, that many in this country are ready to take on bold steps, demands such as ending the influence of money in politics and ending rigged voting laws. So another, another, another dot uh, in, uh, in terms of the readiness uh, of progressives, the, the working class, to make bold moves uh, in this period. So we must seize the moment and develop new tactics for this, uh, this time. We must make bold demands that capture the imagination and give impetus to our movement. Lenin uh, went on to state that it is not enough to be a revolutionary and ad an adherent of socialism or a communist in general. You must be able at each particular moment to find the particular link in the chain which you must grasp with all your might in order to hold the whole chain and to prepare firmly for the transition to the next link. So here we're talking about tactics that are geared to a full understanding of the objective conditions in which we exist at the moment, and this is a very interesting period in our history. So while the fire is hot, we must put forth and struggle for bold demands in areas where a sector of the ruling class is ready to yield. And this is just some of the things that, I, that I'm just putting out there, you know, there need to be further discussion, but we certainly need a massive jobs program, massive influx of, of money in the trillions of dollars uh, to uh, take care of our infrastructure, aging infrastructure, create massive jobs in all the industries uh, and to reduce the unemployment, not only the uh, unemployed but also those that are, um, that are partially employed. Medicare for all expands social security. That puts a lot of money into the hands of, of a lot of working class people. Move people out of poverty through massive earned income credit and higher wages. A tax on wealth and financial transactions could be used to uh, finance uh, the massive just programs, certainly Medicare for all, expanding Social Security. And, um, and we also need new labor rights in legislation. The working class needs to, inc the organized working class needs to strengthen. They're looking for new avenues of, of organizing and they need the protections of the law. So that is the end of my, my um, presentation. Um, again, the ruling class has recognized there's major threats to the capitalist system itself because of the gross inequality in incomes and wealth. And I think there a sector of them are ready to make concessions and we should uh, be making bold demands. And that's the end of, the, um, of my presentation and now I think we're we're ready to move on to uh, John Case uh, presentation. Okay, I will change the um, Thank you, Alvaro. Okay, John, you should be able to show your screen now. We don't hear you talking. We see your screen but we don't hear you. Okay, your mic is still muted, okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, testing one, two? Yes, okay. we can hear you. You need okay, to- Okay, cool. Is this, this, is this the, the uh, classes in 1861 is the slide you wanna yeah. start with? Uh, yes, it is, yes. O okay. Okay, so uh, this presentation is really a, uh, an attempt at a case study uh, examining the question about the need to divide ruling classes in order to uh, move forward uh, in social progress. And uh, so I, uh, uh, an incident that I thought uh, illustrated the uh, basic principles as well as uh, an understanding of class um, 
could be usefully examined in the uh, historical incident around the um, dismissal of General uh, John C. Fremont by uh, Abraham Lincoln in 1861 when he was the commander of the uh, Western Front. Uh, General Fremont had been a uh, soldier in the Mexican War and had been uh, famous as an adventurer uh, uh, leading expeditions all the way to California, becoming the first governor of California, and uh, a celebrated uh, individual in the, in, the, in the 19th century. Anyway, he uh, was, uh, the situation in, in 1861 um, was interesting from a class standpoint, and because a question I want to put up for discussion here is whether Lincoln's dismissal of Fremont against the advice, for example, of the radical Republicans in Congress, the abolitionist uh, Frederick Douglass, um, and uh, was it correct or not? And this, I don't propose that there's a simple answer to the question, uh, but I propose that trying to answer it uh, once you get a picture of the background. By the way, uh, the readings for this class, which I put on the uh, um, links to the slides include uh, a, a very interesting uh, description of this and survey of the events surrounding this incident by uh, Karl Marx um, as well as others. But in any event, uh, my, my purpose here is to try and uh, talk about a particular class configuration in our own history which still plays out in some ways and a revolutionary situation, even though it was taking place within a constitutional framework, uh, more or less, um, and a, 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 the conclusion of which resulted in the extermination of two social classes, one of them a uh, part of a ruling class coalition, the uh, slave-owning class of the South. But the other class that was exterminated were the slaves, enslaved as well. Um, so two classes were abolished as a result of this conflict. Um, now, uh, it, you know, to, to, to give a little bit of uh, uh, insight into the uh, composition of the classes in 1861, you can include the slave-owning slave class uh, consisted probably of about 300,000 people, according to Marx, who was uh, you know carefully following it at the time and. Uh, those figures are pretty close to some others that uh, you can find if you want to look into it. And uh, out of many, many millions of um, uh, both uh, non-slave owning whites and of course a enslaved population that, ra that ranged from 30 to nearly 50 percent or more of the uh, Confederate States. At the time, uh, or shortly before the Civil War, chattel slaves were, in, were themselves the largest single, or well, the longest, largest category of wealth assets in the United States. It exceeded all industrial capital. It exceeded the value of land. It exceeded the value of, uh, of, com of uh, any other commercial sector, um, the trade in slaves. And so that, uh, and the fact that most of the South had been converted, well not most, but about half of the South had been converted uh, by ruining their agriculture from actual slave-based agriculture to the actual production and breeding of slaves led to some of the worst abuses. It was uh, enhanced by the, you know, ironically in some ways by the invention of the cotton gin which automated what had previously been slave labor. And so slaves were exported like goods uh, in, um, uh, all, uh, to Western uh, territories. And obviously the economy of, of the slave trade, the internal slave trade, was so uh, great that it was one of the biggest driving forces of the Confederate demand for expansion West. And it was these expansion West that threatened uh, free soilers and farmers and the independent non-slave owning uh, uh, businesses uh, which were expanding in the north uh, in 
greater and greater every year since the steam engine was invented. Um, and so you ha down in the south, you also had some other classes, mainly smaller farmers, you know, but, but also some, uh, you had very little commodities in the south. Even professionals and, and craftsmen and artisans who did their work mainly did it for trade and kind. There was not, there was a, a, a very small amount of actual co trade and commodities uh, going on in, this, in the southern states. Most wealth was in land and they did not have cash unless they were selling product of one kind or another to England or to the north or to somebody else. So they were all land rich and cash poor, which is another reason why the thing they could trade quickest was the enslaved people themselves, again leading to some of the worst abuses. Um, as, as, uh, and of course, as time went on, the incompatibility of the slave economic system with the expansion of uh, emerging capitalism, you should keep in mind that at the, at the same time while industry was picking up in the North, it was still under 10% of the workforce. Uh, most people were working in agricultural labor. Uh, in the north and were independent, you know, not necessarily independent farmers, that was only about 10 to 15 percent, but other people working for them um, accounted to, for most labor still. So, um, but nevertheless, every time, as, the, as industry grew and cities grew, every time a city grows that accelerates the, uh, the need for, you know, more intensive farming, which was opposed to slave farming. And so everything was building up that made it impossible uh, to coexist. The final straw being the demand of the uh, Confederate president Buchanan that uh, that fugitive slaves, that, that slave owners could take their slaves into any territory of the Union uh, and uh, do their business and then they were infect the rest of the country with the slave population. And that caused the most important split of that era and that was the split between the Northern and Southern Democrats and the emergence of the Republican Party, all of which uh, tended to uh, coincide uh, with the, uh, um, well, pretty much with the, uh, with the inc growing incompatibility, incompatibility of the systems following the, uh, the Kansas Act, which made it possible to, uh, to uh, uh, basically bring slavery into the, any territory west of the Mississippi. So, uh, so with, that, with that kind of conflict set up and with the coalition that elected uh, uh, Lincoln dependent entirely uh, upon actually the division between the Confederate candidate, I think his name was Breckinridge, and the Northern Democrats candidate who was Stephen Douglas, um, and because the Northern Democrats disagreed with the Confederacy, they thought that the basically the Missouri Compromise of even Stephen all the way should be not be violated, um, and they split with them on that issue. So we get involved, uh, and uh, I, I want to set the stage here for the discussion question. We get involved uh, very early in the war, and you have to keep in mind the fact that uh, the situation with uh, in 1861 with the, uh, uh, the Union Army as well as the Southern Army, most officers that were trained in military science had gone with the South. Um, but neither had either the, the capacity at first to actually uh, weigh, uh, mobilize the level of troops that had been uh, recruited. There was not an officer corps, which was one that led to the, a lot of political corruption in the appointment of officers. A lot of politicians were, you know, appointed colonels and generals and officers, and and people who really had no military training or very little uh, were put in, in very powerful positions over a whole bunch of folks that had never fought a war. So uh, you had a, you know, a, you know, a, a situation that was by no means. Um, uh, stable on any front, and um, and so the Lincoln strategy of uh, trying to keep the border states, and the border states, of course, were those in which um, 
you know, actually, if you mixed states, which actually, in fact, initially included Virginia, uh, Kentucky, and um, uh, Tennessee, as, as well as Missouri, these were states in which, you know, slave constitutions were not in effect. And there was a mixed system of both free and of slave, enslaved labor. Um, and, and not only that, these states by and large, except for Virginia, of course, had uh, not mobilized their people into armies to support the Confederacy, even though the Confederacy claimed them as part of their domain. Um, and at the same time, in Virginia, of course, the, you know, the split that was, was resulted in the separation of uh, West Virginia from Virginia, uh, West Virginia being mostly uh, free uh, farming and non-slave owning folks that had felt disenfranchised in the, the way the plantation-based Virginia government was being or had been organized. So you had a, a lot of these, you know, now uh, different configures. Now once the war started, of course, the question of how all these different forces were going to fall became a, uh, a critical matter in terms of whether, you know, you were going to prevail or not. Um, and, uh, and whether the rebellion was going to be put down, whether the outcome of the rebellion would be the secession of states permanently. Um, there were many factors that hinged on that. I encourage you to read the, uh, the uh, links I have in there for Marx. We, he uh, talks very, very interestingly about the, uh, how close a call it was that prevented the, uh, the British from recognizing the Confederacy. And it was really, frankly, Antietam that talked them out of it. Um, in any event, um, 1861, the war has started. The current um, position of the Congress as the, the, uh, the law is, is that um, if, if in rebel, in, in that people who are disloyal to the United States, people who have borne arms or who are part of the Confederate militias in the border states, uh, that the Union is free in combat with them to uh, expropriate without compensation any enslaved people that uh, were property. Uh, but it did not authorize the uh, expropriation of slaves owned by loyal, uh, pro-union, uh, not secession, um, citizens um, uh, in the uh, border states. Uh, when uh, John C. Fremont, who was a very well-known re radical Republican, a consistent, as Frederick Douglass said, anti-slavery voice in the United States, uh, a consistent abolitionist. Um, when he was appointed the commander of the West, he did a number of things with, uh, that are, you know, have been debated militarily over the years. But, but one of the things he did was is that he uh, issued a proclamation which emancipated not only the slaves of disloyal um, Missouri citizens, also of uh, loyal ones. And uh, for this, uh, it caused a, uh, a, a cheer amongst abolitionist and radical Republican forces in Congress. Uh, it was supported by Marx, uh, initially, actually. Um, I, I want to say that, that over, over time, uh, different voices you know, modified their position somewhat. But we're, we're talking about the, the moment here. I mean, the, the moment when you are in, things are in flux and you are faced with you know, a certain kind of decision and not everybody has perfect information, um, you know, especially back then. All right, uh, President Lincoln's information may not have been the same that, uh, uh, about the entire political situation that uh, Frederick Douglass or, for that matter, uh, Sam and Chase or any of the other uh, players in the, uh, at the time, uh, uh, Sumner, from, Sumner from Massachusetts. Um, all of them argued very strenuously against the dismissal. But Lincoln dismissed him on the grounds that uh, he was advised from uh, the people in Kentucky 
uh, and, and others that uh, this would throw the uh, loyal slave owners in the in Kentucky especially into the arms of the Confederacy and that that would cause a collapse of their independent position of their neutral whatever non non-combatant um, stay in the Union position and so uh, Lincoln uh, fired him at that time uh, thinking that if the border states fell to the Confederate control, that the prospects for the war would be uh, much reduced. And in fact, of course, uh, the fact that it only it was not, in fact, until the Battle of Antietam uh, that um, you know, Lincoln had demonstrated that he could resist a uh, the, the Army of Northern Virginia by, uh, uh, headed by General Lee, that he could resist them invading the North, and that was the fact that he could resist it you know, is, is what convinced the British Parliament, a very interesting articles by Marx on this, to uh, uh, not recognize the Confederacy. Uh, so and, and 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 the other important turning point, of course, is is that even though Lincoln fired um, uh, uh, Fremont, as Marx, by the way, later observes, uh, he uh, began almost immediately, this was 1861, he began almost immediately rethinking the need for an emancipation proclamation. And so uh, it's hard not to observe a coincidence in time and, um, and in change in his own judgment. Um, uh, that even though he, he became, uh, no one knew more than Lincoln what the essence of the struggle in the Civil War was, um, but uh, he became persuaded, interestingly, over time in different ways of how the uh, of how the configuration could actually work and be carried out. And of course, um, we know how it ended up, but but the. Uh, uh, but it's a uh, it's an interesting debate to have between uh, historically between left forces generally rec generally represented by the abolitionist voices, um, and, and of course in this case if you want to do the readings by Marx um, and uh, Lincoln's own statement. And I, I'm going to basically you know end this at this point on the uh, my presentation with um, um, with a. Uh, a little thing I found on the web, but which I think actually act, accurately introduces um, what I think would be an interesting discussion question. And I repeat that I don't, do not think that there is a simple a simple answer to this question. Uh, but I think it's a good way to explore um, what constitutes a coalition aligned for a particular historical time to accomplish a particular historical task in this case a revolutionary one, but how the coalition forces involved in that revolution can play out is, is quite complicated. Uh, obviously, you know. Uh, uh, so anyway, uh, this is, I'm going to read this. I have it on the screen now, but I'm going to read it, and then that'll be uh, the uh, decision to make to either endorse uh, Fremont's order of mass emancipation in the border states uh, or to revoke it. Uh, um, and uh, basically, so I'm going to read these two statements. So in August, it's August 30, 1861. The war has been raging for more than four months, but four slave states, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, have not yet joined the Confederacy. If they leave the Union and add their strength to the rebel cause, I think, we're quoting Lincoln here, or well, we're actually paraphrasing a speech he made uh, in this little quip here. I think the war is lost. Today, my Western commander, John Fremont, makes a stunning proclamation. The war is not going well, and as a military matter, he frees the slaves of all rebels in Missouri. The order thrills those who oppose slavery in the North, but it goes further than the loyal slave, uh, goes further than Congress's new confiscation law allows and angers slaveholders in loyal slave states, threatening to push them into the arms of the Confederacy. Um, and so we have uh, uh, um, um, Frederick Douglass, um, who says, to fight against slaveholders, 
without fighting against slavery is but a half-hearted business and paralyzes the hands engaged in it. Fire must be met with water. War for the destruction of liberty must be met with war for the destruction of slavery. And yet, and then on the other one, Joshua Speed, who was from a uh, Kentucky uh, uh, representative, um, and um, Kentucky's Confederate sympathizers and even pro-unionists do not want to free 20,000 slaves. Fremont may as well attack the freedom to worship in the North or the right of a parent to teach his children to read. Endorsing this proclamation may lead to the emancipation of slaves in Missouri, but it could lead to Kentucky's secession. Um, so um, um, I, I, I realize that folks have somewhat limited knowledge on this, and you should know also that, of course, uh, uh, Frederick Douglass's uh, um, relationship with uh, Lincoln himself uh, evolved over time, um, and uh, I think to the point where they both said by 1864 they understood each other perfectly, <laughs> whatever that meant. Um, but anyway, I'm going to stop there and uh, invite you guys to um, uh, folks to uh, uh, comment on it and uh, render your own judgment if you can, or ask further questions about it if I can answer them, I will. That's it. Okay, at this time, uh, we will um, entertain the participation of the uh, uh, people who are here. And uh, so I will, um, if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, I, I, what we'd like to do is, is have each uh, participant who wants to speak, uh, be it uh, pose a question or make a comment, to we want to go through all of those. And then we'll turn the floor back over to John, and he'll uh, respond to those comments or questions. Uh, uh, um, and then, um, as he chooses, and then we'll turn the floor over to Alvaro, and he'll respond to the comments and questions uh, as he chooses. And each, uh, in their turn, will make uh, closing uh, remarks. So uh, at this time, all participants are invited to uh, ask a question or make comments. And so if you'd like to do so, please, you, uh, please click your raised hand icon, the hand. Just click the hand, the raised hand icon. That'll let me know you want to speak, and I will open your mic. So Jordan Hardy, your mic is open. Jordan Hardy, your mic is open. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I um, I always look at the Civil War as um, proof that sometimes war is actually necessary in order to abolish the social injustice, which is actually worse than the war itself. Uh, I just wanted to see if you guys agreed with that or. Yes. Okay, uh, so we want to collect all the comments and questions, and then uh, uh, each uh, panelist can respond in their turn. So, okay, thank you, uh, Jordan. And anyone else? I'm scrolling through, looking for raised hands. Anyone else? So I don't see any more raised hands. So if you would like to respond, uh, John, go ahead. Uh, sure. Sometimes, um, sometimes war is un. I think history history has demonstrated that sometimes war is unavoidable. Um, I do think in the area in the in the in the days of mass media like now that. It, uh, certain tactics are possible that might not have been possible a hundred years ago. I, I have a hard time imagining Dr. King's movement having quite the same success in 1860 as it did in 1960. You know, um, partly because the whole world can see and the moral message gets out rather than gets you know exterminated. So, but I but then it, but I don't think anything. Uh, uh, you, these things are thrust upon you. Um, 
you know, one of the interesting things in Lincoln's uh, a second inaugural, you know, that he observes right in the beginning, um, and I think everybody thought as well, is that no one, no one thought that it would do the damage, that conflict that it did. No one thought that it would be that big, that horrible. And um, and it got out of, uh, you know, that it becomes a thing in itself. And so I think uh, um, we cannot rule it out, you know, that uh, you have to, you know, uh, if, for example, if institutions fail, well, whoever has the most guns wins, okay? So the answer is yes sometimes. Okay, I'm looking for raised hands, and uh, you're invited to uh, ask a question. You're invited to make a comment. I'm looking for raised hands. You just use your raised. Okay, I see some people are choosing to write in the... Uh, so, um, Carl Page uh, says, John... How were the Confederate slave owner capitalists able to rouse the non-slave owning citizens to fight uh, and risk their lives for them? So how were the Confederate slave owners able to uh, mobilize the non-slave owning citizens to fight and risk their lives for them? Right. Well, I mean, you, you want me to answer that now, or you want to? Okay, go on. Yeah, go on. Yeah. yeah. Well, so I mean, you got to keep in mind the the Confederacy was a a dictatorship, or, or certainly developed into one, um, in which the propertied classes retained all political power, and it was written into their state constitutions. Um, and also, you got to keep in mind that most. A uh, small farm, most like say you were uh, the non-slave owning whites in the south, for example, which would be, would be many cases tenant farming or just engaged in trades related to the plantation economy that were you know not suitable to uh, slave labor. Okay, I mean for example, if you had to have a certain amount of education to do the trade, a lot of the artisan work and craft work, stuff like that. I mean, you were, you know, from the slave owner's point of view, he wasn't going to get very many slaves involved in that, okay? Uh, so you had, yeah, yeah, but that, 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 the, the dependency on the local plantation economy, which was not, remember the capitalist part, the, think, about the, think about what is the capitalist part of the slaveocracy, okay? Well, one was the mercantile part, which is they produce and they sell a whole bunch of cotton or tobacco to England, all right, and so and that's and they get paid back either in cash or in kind, okay. But they, if they had any cash at all, it came from that, uh, primarily because that's where the manufacturer of uh, linens and and te early textiles was being advanced, uh, and tobacco was being consumed, of course, everywhere. But um, but one of the problems was with the, you know, the exploitation of the soil and the and, and the plantation culture was such that most of it was self-sustaining and very few commodities were bought or sold except for the richest people bought themselves. Jefferson bought himself thousands of books and all kinds of other things, you know. Um, but there wasn't much economy going on in that economy. Now later there was, and the economy was the trade in slaves. Now that was chattel capitalism in a way because you know that was actually a uh, that, that not an agricultural you know act, act at all. Um, so I think that you had a ruling class that was a landed class. There were aspects of capitalism to it, but it was not a full. I think it was wrong to characterize the slave system in general as capitalist. Okay, even though there were capitalist aspects to it. But the dominant forces were not in that direction, and they were not in the direction of improving commodity production because they couldn't, because you can't do commodity production efficiently with slave labor. Okay, so um, I think so. I think that's my best answer that I can I can give to that question. All right, your mic is open, Pat. Your mic is open. 
Oh, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I really appreciate both presentations. Um, this has been a very, very interesting discussion and, um, and quite timely given um, the debate on the left around um, the electoral tactics in this election. Um, I, I just have a, a question for Alvaro. Um, and you know, I may have just missed this, but when you say that Wall Street is a part of, um, you know, uh, is, is that there's contradictions that could lead it to winning over part of Wall Street to a progressive agenda. Um, that, that's kind of what I heard. And, you know, beyond the IMF, and I think you mentioned uh, a Bank of England, I'm not sure. Um, what, what else do you see there in Wall Street um, that would lead you to conclude that it could be a part of a progressive coalition? And um, on John's presentation, um, you know, what leads me to think uh, is this adage that I've always appreciated. It's not enough to win. I mean, it, it's not enough to be correct. You have to win. And uh, I, you know, I'm I'm grappling with the ex, with with the example of the Civil War, and how does it pertain today to the situation we're confronted here? Uh, a lot of the criticism against uh, Hillary Clinton is of her hawkish stand uh, and her you know, some of the neocons that she's had in her, um, in, um, you know, around her. Um, so I guess I would see that as an example of what confronted Lincoln uh, around uh, whether to, um, to, to fire the general. So I, I, is, that, is that the kind of thing you're, you're trying to get at? Because I, I think it's a really important example that, for today. Okay, yes. just a minute, just a minute. There are a few more, and let's take them, and then we'll move to the, uh, to the, uh, we'll turn the floor back over to John, and then the floor uh, for the final time over to Alvaro. Um, there was another hand that I'm looking, uh, that I'm looking for now. Okay, there's a comment. Um, in the Lenin quote, Lenin pointed to conflict of interest among sections of capital, not conflicts of ideology. What are the conflicts of interest within U.S. capital? For instance, is the, I guess, is there a conflict between finance capital and industrial capital, or is industrial capital completely subordinate to finance capital? Isn't the current election at the presidential level a conflict between finance capital, capital and the smaller, fry, uh, big capitalists who are struggling against them, e.g. Trump, uh, Koch brothers for their place in the sun. I don't take the hand uh, wringing about inequality too seriously. Uh, so that's from Richard uh, Fallenbaum. All right, so that's it in terms of, let me make sure uh, that there's no other hand. And I don't see another hand, so uh, we'll turn it back over to you for the final uh, time, John, and then we'll turn it over to uh, Alvaro for the final time. Well, I, 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 I'll just close by trying to answer the question of the relevance to today. Okay, the first relevance to me is is that I think you need to be concrete uh, when you talk about uh, divisions um, in ruling classes or between classes in general. I think it's also important to uh, uh, or helpful. Uh, there's a lot of ways to define class. And, of course, Marx's uh, framework was to define it as a relation to production. And uh, <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, relations to production change every time production changes, and it changes every time uh, there's a new division of labor um, or, and a distribution of, of capital. 
so there's many, many, many shifts that are very concrete and in a particular time and place um, are going to uh, determine the shape of a political outcome. Now we can say from a broad historical standpoint that the um, conflict between the slave system and the emerging capitalist system, especially since capitalism had an almost endless area in which to expand, and no very few, very, very few feudal remnants to, to hold it in chains, other than the slave system in the South, which was a, you know, unusual mix of feudal and, and, and capitalist elements. Um, well, but so, but so this conflict was inevitable, you know, and of course many Americans have argued have, 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 have uh, who, who, you know, for a generation before me and, you know, my family, you know, who lived through it, um, um, you know, argued forever about whether it was necessary or inevitable or not, and uh, I'm sure that's t that argument has taken place, and uh, it took place more, of course, in the past. But, but um, it's hard to see how it was avoidable, and um, it's uh, and, and I think the big relevance today is we have to ask the same question: Are the class conflicts, you know, going on today? You know, are they, do they reflect tensions and, uh, and incompatibilities that rise to those that occurred in the buildup to the Civil War? Um, and remember, you know, the Confederacy was controlled, I mean, excuse me, Congress was controlled by the Confederacy, uh, well, at least the Senate was, and the presidency for all the way up until pretty much Lincoln, okay? Um, and... Um, the political control was uh, uh, being tested at every every level um, in the thing, but at a certain point, institutions could no longer function, um, you know, and carry out the law. You could not implement the fugitive slave law without rebellion. Uh, you could not, um, you know, permit the endless expansion of slavery um, because it was leading to terroristic activities in Kansas and Missouri. And so, and, and, and later provocation to the point where, the, and the slave owners knew it. They, 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 they were in a situation, they, if they could not expand, they could not survive. They knew it would happen. And so they, they provoked it. And, um, um, and so, you, you, you know, a, a tremendous conflict arose. Now, I think we have to ask the question today, uh, uh, you know, some, uh, along the lines that uh, Thomas Piketty asked in the, in, the, in the Alvaro's presentation. We have to ask the question, um, you know, well, is there an is there an adjustment that can be made in uh, the relations between public and private? A new t different tax reforms, uh, a, a redistribution of wealth, even on an incremental basis, an increase in bargaining power of workers that could reverse the austerity inequality uh, uh, tendencies that we see everywhere. And, and what's, what does it take to do that, and what does it look like right after you try and fix that? So I, I, I think we're a little bit like folks before. We don't know how big this conflict is going to be. I think the closer we get to it, the more serious it looks. And uh, is, it, does it, it, is the outcome the overthrow of capitalism? Well, I doubt that, certainly not in an absolute sense. But uh, there is a restructuring of class relations that's on the horizon here. And um, it, w it, will it be less severe than, than what we endured through the Civil War? Well, God, let's hope so. Uh, but I don't think when you enter these things that there's any guarantee of it. Um, you know, in some ways, the, the pitch that um, the Clintons make uh, uh, ha and have made all along is that, well, you know, there's a healthy part of capitalism in the, you know, high tech and all these other things that they get their backing from, um, and um, and that the best way to do things is to you know uh, you know to kind of develop these positive parts and triangulate the uh, you know the ultra right somehow, but uh, you know I think one of the things that's happening is the people are saying that uh, well if you know it's been 40 years of no raises except for a couple of years in the middle of 97 98 really. 40 years, no races, you know, for the working class of the United States. 
and uh, that's two and a half generations. And uh, you know, I mean, I think that we're at the situation right now where you know, unless there is a significant movement forward, that you, you know, the uh, the disarray and the failure of institutions is going to become aggravated. Um, so I'm I'm hoping my personal hope is that Bernie and Hillary can uh, make the kind of deal that we can all live with at least to at least to move forward, try to get a majority in Congress where uh, we can do something. Uh, if we don't get that, then it's going to be eight more years of uh, gee, you know, we're we're holding back the uh, the Bulgarians from the gates, but there's still no race. <laughs> just you know, I think that's just driving people nuts. Okay, so. Um, uh, so I think there's a big relevance, you know, and you got to be very, be very detailed. You know, the situation of, of Lincoln and Fremont, and you know, the complexity of the situation. Uh, you know, will the follow-up? Well, you can find that in every single town in the United States. You know, go run for mayor, and you'll find a no less complicated configuration confronting you right there as to how you get something done. And I think we're at the point in politics, uh, especially institutions are failing and movements are trying to get uh, more powerful, where it's important not just to describe a problem, but to describe what to do, do about it. That's it. Okay, okay John. Uh, Alvaro, you have the floor. You have to unmute your mic. And John, you can mute your mic. Okay, um, I'm not sure that I'm going to have a lot of uh, thoughtful uh, comments concerning the Civil War. Um, that was a um, tremendous conflict. Uh, 600,000 dead. It, uh, the largest loss uh, uh, of U.S. Uh, soldiers in, in all of, uh, of U.S. Uh, wars put together. Um, and that was a war that was imposed on the North by the violence initiated from the South. So it wasn't certainly not Lincoln's. Um, Lincoln was the one that started the fight uh, over the slave issue. In fact, he did everything possible to avoid this armed conflict, this civil war that that happened. Um, and 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 there was a, a question asked about how, how were the uh, Southerners uh, uh, convinced to to join the fight, especially those that were not uh, slave owners. I think a lot of it was appealed to Southern nationalism, the South, and Southern culture. Amazingly enough, I just finished attending a uh, meeting of this Board of Trustees of the Houston Independent School District, one of the largest uh, school districts in the country. And the major item on the agenda was to change the names of many of the schools that are named after Southern uh, Confederate generals. And most of the opposition or the divisions on the issue came out between people of color on one side and and white uh, uh, people on the other. So people here in Houston and in the South are still fighting the Civil War, and uh, they fight it in different ways, but they're still there. Um, now on the issue. Uh, the question about Wall Street, what part of Wall Street, what, what constitutes, uh, uh, which sector are we talking about? Um, I mentioned that this, this coalition for inclusive capitalism that sees a big problem with the inequities in wealth and in today, who's really trying to modify the, the ruling class shift uh, to neoliberalist policies, that is unfettered capitalism uh, uh, with minimal regulation, with uh, minimum taxation, with uh, minimum impediments to uh, global um, tentacles all over the world, that, that this has come to very bad results and that it needs to be reversed. Again, this, some of the people that are involved in this inclusive uh, coalition for inclusive capitalism were some of the same people that were involved in the neoliberalist movement, but they have realized they went too far and they want to turn back. Who are these people again? Um, I think this, this group that formed around this coalition is, represents one-third of all the global liquid assets uh, around the whole globe. So this is not insignificant, and it's not divided. It's not. It's not a conflict 
uh, between a sector of capital, that is the industrial capital versus finance capital. Finance capital and industrial capital have been together since since Lenin talked about back in the 1800s when Lenin talked about um, you know, uh, imperialism, the highest sta you know, uh, stage of monopoly capitalism, that was already an integration between finance capital and industrial capital. Right now the dominant capitalist sector is the finance capital all over the world. And uh, the, there is no real dispute between them. There is a dispute uh, within street in terms of which tactics they are to use to try and further the interest of capitalism. And there's this, I mentioned that one, one of these groupings uh, in Wall Street uh, grouped around Robert Rubin. He used to be the former Secretary of the Treasury. He used to be with uh, Goldman Sachs and with also with Citigroup. In fact, uh, he spent two years recently with Citigroup and, and uh, got $146 million in compensation for his efforts. Um, but many people, uh, part of the problem is our own, in our own leftist uh, jargon, that uh, we group Wall Street all as one single group, and they're, they're not. There's different sectors of, the, uh, of, of capital. They're all pro-capitalist, obviously. But one sector is more socially um, liberal <clears throat> than the other, and uh, and now they're coming uh, they're coming together on the issues of economic and wealth inequality, and and this group uh, is around Robert Rubin, who's who's, who's not he's, he's very influential with the Council of Foreign Relations, where most of the large influential think tanks and and people um, and capitalists join together, come together as one of the venues. Um, this is the same group that was behind Bill Clinton. This is the same group that results in the winning for Barack Obama. And it's the same group that's now supporting Hillary Clinton. So oh, they're, they're there and they're very influential and they have a winning strategy and they will try to use this, that winning strategy uh, in this coming elections. And in this case, they do already make some concessions. It's, but we think about concessions pretty much like uh, Franklin Roosevelt concessions. Roosevelt said, make me do it. He's not going to do it on his own. Hillary, you know, if she becomes the, the candidate, is not going to do it. Uh, is not going to raise them in a waste of $15 an hour. She's not going to initiate any of these things. She, she'll have to be forced to do so. And, and that requires a movement, a very strong movement, but with a movement that recognizes that this sector of capital is ready to make some concessions. If you make bold demands, you may get, I don't know if we're going to get 15 uh, increase in the minimum wage, but we certainly want to get maybe 12, you know, I, I don't know what's going to end up at, but you have to ask for it, you have to continue to struggle. The labor movement that, that started the 5 for 15 has shown us that the tactic has worked, that you can actually unionize workers, fast food workers, service workers uh, around an economic issue. Like It's very clear and very uh, important to them which is to increase wages. And they have won. So we have city after city has already passed resolutions uh, uh, and, uh, to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, and, um, and that's going to continue to increase and become a, a, um, uh, an issue around the whole country. So we need to raise that demand plus other demands, even further larger demands at this time because I think that there are a sector of capital ready to, to support some of the to some extent, or they can be forced to make concessions on those things, just like the sessions were made back in the 1930s. Um, as I mentioned, uh, some of the people that were involved in this coalition for inclusive capitalists included uh, multinational corporations such as Dow Chemical, Aetna, PepsiCo, Unilever, Blackstone, which one is, is the largest equity uh, private uh, equity co company in the United States, uh, commercial and investment bankers from around the world. Um, primarily in the Anglo-Saxon world, Wall Street, but also Fleet Street in the UK and beyond. Uh, and this is a very influential sector. Again, it, this, this, 
these questions are not over fundamental issues like capitalism or no capitalism. They're over issues of of tactics and which would be the best way to create political stability within uh, the ruling class uh, and, and within capitalism. How to create the most stable form of capitalism for the long term instead of just looking at the short term. So what's been happening since the, since the 1980s is a very short uh, term outlook on the part of the uh, chief executive officers of a lot of these uh, corporations where they're um, basically raiding the um, the coffers of the corporations they're 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 ruining the working class and and they're also going after uh the stockholders and stealing a lot of the money so uh, they feel that there has to be a stop about the new liberalist uh, has to be moderated um, and steps need to be taken to 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 fight the worst aspects of of inequality, wealth, and income. A lot of times we focus on income inequality, but the part of it is is wealth inequality. Ten percent of the people in this country own seventy percent of all the wealth in the country. And as we said, concentrated wealth leads to concentrated power and political power. Um, so that's that's all I have to say at this point. Okay, I'd like to thank uh, uh, John Case and Alvaro Rodriguez for their participation in this class. As is evident to everyone, we, uh, we need to do more and we will try to develop classes where we can explore uh, these matters uh, even more. So I thank you uh, for your participation, the participants as well as the presenters. And I wish you a good uh, evening and we hope to see you uh, at our future class, our, our next class coming up is on the Vietnamese path to socialism. That will be uh, May 25th uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern, May 25th, Wednesday, May 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern. We'll be doing a class on Vietnamese, the, Vietnam, uh, the Vietnamese plat, uh, path to socialism. So thank uh, uh, everyone again for their participation and good night. Thank you, Dean. Bye-bye.